No. Senator Comfort. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Secretary and team, uh, for your stellar work. Um, I'm very, very grateful. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the DPU, but I'm realizing that maybe we, well, maybe it'll be a bank shot that someone can uh, answer. Um, so I'm glad that the DPU recently completed a rulemaking to implement the 2021 um, climate legislation. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's good. Um, but I really, okay. and I'm sure this is not new to any of my colleagues, I hear from constituents every day um, who are eager uh, for the DPU um, or waiting to see the changes from the 2022 Drive Act. Um, now, I understand that the DPU is open to docket, um, if I'm correct, and, um, and that is good, right? We're going to start to talk about that. Um, but I just I, I have a, a general question about how we're going to meet our climate goals if the implementation of the legislation takes so very long. Uh, and I don't discount the complexity um, and I don't discount the staffing issues, Secretary, that you ended with. Uh, but I just I wonder what the plan is to help DPU um, open dockets more quickly, churn through and implement legislation more quickly. Um, uh, Representative Blay and I have a single parcel rule that probably has plagued many of you um, from our constituents. And, you know, that's impeding solar development in a rural Western Massachusetts where we have these single parcels and they're not going to, you know, the multiple units won't get the benefit of net metering. And it's stymied that growth. And most of that is small solar developers working with small um, sized um, developments, but still we, I think we need it right in that 30 gigawatt goal. So I just wonder about this. What's the plan for the DPU? I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think Jamie, can you, anyway, I don't think we can hear you. So um, you want to try one more time, but otherwise we'll just answer for you. No, no, no. a little bit. Do you, do you want me to mic the laptop or we feed back? Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. Well, um, I, I first of all, I, I we were all happy to see, as you as you said, that 2021 um, uh, rules come come out, and um, I, I do think those are those are a good first start. But they, we need to implement the 2022 as well. Mike, do you want to? Yeah. No. I mean, I. I uh, the, yeah. yeah. Sure. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll come a little closer. So, um, no, my understanding is that in the department's uh, order uh, approving the, the final rules, uh, they indicated that they, they are going to expeditiously move to implement the 2022 rules once those regulations are promulgated in the state register, which I believe should be by the end of this week, I think. Uh, I'm not positive about that, but it's it, they, so they should be able to open the next rulemaking very quickly and hopefully move much faster um, with that one because it is a much, uh, it's, it's far less complex uh, in terms of the change that are contemplated. And I understand the single parcel rule uh, changes are also going to be implemented separately and that they are working very hard on that. I think we 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 understand, um, you know, the speed at which uh, we need to move and we're trying to uh, get the DP the resources that they need to to move dockets uh, along faster. So it's it's certainly a top priority of ours. So, Under Secretary, is it resources? Uh, that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, yeah, particularly in the legal division, I think that's that's been a challenge um, is uh, obtaining and retaining, uh, you know, good legal talent that that can move these dockets through faster. I think that's that's been a major uh, a major obstacle. And Secretary, does this budget account for the resources that DPU needs to staff up? You know, I think that we're going to have to continue to try to get some, you know, the DPU is funded through um, assessments from the utilities. Right. So we would need to increase increase that assessment um, in order to increase, increase the, the budget there. They, they have some uh, positions that they can fill, um, which they're trying. And I, I will tell you from having been there and being the general counsel there, one of the hard things about recruiting is that it's a really complicated, you know, really complicated um, 
subject matter. And so it's hard to find people who know anything about it. And then when you know, when you get people who are younger and you train them, they're in diet, you know, everybody wants to hire them because now they've been trained by the DPU and they're, you know, and they leave after three years, you know, everybody's having problems hiring right now. And, and I know and it's a difficult situation, but the DPU is, you know, near and dear to my heart. I am very committed to making it work well. Um, I am also cognizant of some of the challenges that we have, and we we really are committed to making that agency everything that that we need it to be. Right. And I should have been more specific. I was thinking about the the agencies that feed into the DPU in the budget, um, but I I understand that the DPU gets its money right from ratepayers, and um, so I, I do think that's. Thank you. Thank you for that commitment. I actually wanted to pivot super quickly to the Grid Modernization Advisory Council, which I'm totally a fan of. Um, and uh, and the and thank you, Under Secretary Judge. Sorry to have to wheel you. Um, uh, and you know, looking at the utilities um, and the you know the plans that they're giving the GMAC, you know, that's I mean, this I I know you, this is sobering stuff, right? What it's going to take in terms of um, the financial investment needed to, to green our homes and businesses. And um, and I wonder what the administration is thinking about the balance between ratepayers, speaking about the DPU and ratepayers, um, and the public investments that may be needed um, so that our constituents, you know, I want the green future you all want, but I'm also worried about people who can't pay their utility bills. And so what's the balance there as you, as the GMAC contemplates this green transition with the utility companies and the really big price tag um, that we're going to look at and how how are we going to pay for this? Yeah, I think affordability is is a uh, top of mind. Um, and the DPU just recently opened a docket specifically on affordability um, because it is we are going to have to think about how we're going to do this in a way that ratepayers can afford and whether that what are the funding mechanisms that we need to do. I, we cannot fund this whole clean transition on the electric bill. So we do need to find additional ways to um, make sure that we that we have an adequate funding to to make that transition and at the same time to be thinking about, particularly for our lowest income um, uh, residents, some kind of mechanisms where we protect them from from high costs. Yeah. Thank you. That's very helpful. And I really do appreciate the work of the GMAC so much. And if I could, I could add, um, you know, the GMAC was created under the 22 climate law and um, we stood up the committee uh, last year, yeah. uh, met, met quite a bit. I think you listened into some of those meetings. Um, I'm a GMAC nerd. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was an interesting process. Um, and what it led to was these electric sector modernization plans, which are now before the chair at the DPU. So I won't talk too much about um, what's in them, although maybe I'll ask the chair just to close his ears. Um, you know, <laughs> we've got three three big cases. They're massive, massive <laughs> documents. Um, and, and the team at DOER is going through them and we're going to be offering testimony next week about our critiques and our suggestions for how to make them better. Um, but a lot of what we're focusing on is really what you're bringing up, Senator, and that is we need to be making these plans in a way that helps the Commonwealth build to a clean energy future while balancing ratepayer needs. And of course, the secretary and I spent a long time at the ratepayer advocates office. So that's a, a hat that we, you can't take off. Um, so it's it's at front of mind. Um, and part of that really comes down to how are the utilities thinking about the future grid? How are they forecasting for future growth? And how are they building for future growth? And what we would really like to see them do is um, create forecasting plans and um, grid update plans in a way that uh, utilizes all the technologies that we know we have before us. So really being smarter about how to build the grid. Uh, you know, one of the things that always frustrates me is that when they build a forecast, they assume that every single electric vehicle is going to charge at the same time, <laughs> at the peak of the day. And that's just not realistic. Um, we, and we also know that there are ways to be smarter about our charging of our electric vehicles. We know that there are, um, there are technologies that we can use to tweak down our heat pumps or, um, you know, we, we all can get Nest thermostats. So we know this works. So we want to bring that together and help the utilities shake off some of their 
typical um, utility thinking and come into uh, this future grid planning. And, you know, they've never had to think about the future. They've always known what do we do before and how do we build it to match what we've done before. So we're trying to think, flip that thinking. Uh, and I would say that these ESMPs are the very baseline start and we have a lot to do um, and we will have another couple of years to, to get it better after these might be approved. Uh, and we've learned a lot and we will continue to press the utilities to work with us and to um, be a little more creative. Exceedingly helpful. Thank you. Thank you both.